All right, now I'm going to preface the sermon I'm going to preach tonight, which I don't normally do, but just with a little bit of my philosophy on, on what church, you know, one of the aspects of church and what, why we come to church and what, what ought to be happening in church. And I think, especially when it comes to the preaching of God's Word, you ought to be being challenged. If you're not being challenged by, by the preaching, by the Word of God, then you're probably not in the right church. We, we ought to be challenged on you know, whether it be preaching against sin and things that you need to ch change in your life. It's all, you know, the whole point of coming here, we need to be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the Son. So if you just keep on going to a place and it's just like the same thing, repetitious over and over again, and there's really not a whole lot being said, how are you ever going to grow? The only way you're going to grow is by being challenged. The only way you're going to grow is by, by being able to look at God's Word and look at your own life and say, hey, what more can I do? Now, in the book of Genesis here, and especially in this latter section of Genesis, we, re we hear a lot about Joseph and what type of a man he was. Now, Joseph was, was marked as a, as a hard worker. Joseph was definitely blessed by God. He had faith in God. But no matter what his circumstances were in his life, he was always excelling. He was always working with what he had. If you remember when Joseph was um, you know, sold into captivity and he was sold to be a slave, and he went into uh, Potiphar's house. And what happened there? He excelled. He worked real hard until he was basically running the household, until he was, you know, bared false witness against and cast into prison. So he goes into prison. What happened in prison? He excelled. He was given, you know, working over the, the people in the prison house. And then when he gets out of prison and he, and he starts working for Pharaoh, right, he excels to where Pharaoh has him running over the whole late land of Egypt. Under the, you know, basically, he was ruling the whole place with Pharaoh just being above him in name and that he was still the one in charge, but Joseph was doing everything. Joseph was a hardworking individual. Now, because of Joseph's uh, um, testimony, because he was such a hard worker, we see here Pharaoh, when, when Israel comes into the land, when Joseph's family comes, Pharaoh is ready to do anything for him. And look at what, what he says here in verse number six. This is where we get to title of my sermon tonight. Verse number six, the Bible reads, The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. So he's giving them the best place. He's saying, you know, he, Joseph kind of instructs them and says, Hey, when Pharaoh asks you what your occupation is, what it is you do, tell him you're a herdman, tell him, you know, and, and this is the land that you want to go to. He kind of gives them this, this, uh, the answers that they ought to do. They ought to tell him. And they come in, and Pharaoh's like, hey, I'm going to give you the best of the land. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. We're continuing here in verse number 6. And look at this. And he says, and if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And that's what we'll be focusing on is, is this last statement here where he says, if you know any men of activity, those are the people, we say, those are the people that I want in charge of my stuff, over my cattle. Why? Because the men of activity, people who are keeping busy, people who are working very hard, those are the ones that are going to get stuff done. Those are the ones that are going to be the most productive. And those are going to be the ones that I want in charge of my stuff. Anybody can be just given a job, given a title, but that means nothing if you're not going to be a man of activity, if you're not going to actually be working hard and doing something. And nobody's going to want to entrust any riches unto you or any responsibility unto you unless you can prove yourself to be someone who's a hard worker, someone who's going to be diligent, someone who's going to be a man of activity. Now, Pharaoh doesn't want to take a chance on someone and just train them from scratch to be a ruler, right? He's already looking for people who are, who are active and, and, and good with, it, with cattle, good with, with the job they're doing, who are experienced. He's looking for people that had the initiative, that don't need to be looking around or just waiting, sitting around waiting for someone else to give them an opportunity. He was looking for people who are, who are driving, working hard to gain that opportunity through their work, through the, the, the work that they're putting forth. Uh, he wanted people that worked hard and figured out what needed to be done and just did it. And this is the type of people that we need at, to work for the Lord to work for our Heavenly Father, people who are willing to just do the work and not just always be told what needs to be done, but just roll up your sleeves and start working and start getting things done. We should be striving to be like this. Look, your entire life can pass by you if you're just waiting around for something to happen, for something to be given to you. 
That's not the way life works. You need to be working hard, and, and when those opportunities arise, when you already have a background of working hard, then those opportunities will be given you, and it's not just going to come. You know, a lot of people just sit around, and I've seen this even just in, in secular work, just in the workforce. People just complaining. They don't do a very good job. They say, oh, well, if you're only going to pay me minimum wage, then I'm just only going to do this for you. And they have that attitude. And then they expect and complain, oh, I've been here for six years. Why is this guy getting promoted? Well, because that guy's working his tail off and doesn't have a, a lousy attitude of not wanting to do anything. And I'll tell you what, you know, out in the world, you're going to find that all day long. But if you're going to have the testimony of being a Christian, then shame on you. Because that's not the way that God says that we ought to be. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. I'll prove it to you from the Bible. Colossians chapter 3. We need to have the attitude where we're ready to just step up and work. And don't always just sit around and wait for someone to ask you to do something. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse number 17. This is, this is the biblical principle. This is what God wants his people, his children, to be hard workers. Look at verse number 17 of Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says, And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Bible saying, whatever you do, look, anything you do, it's not even just things that you do within the church or things that you do specifically for God. He's saying, all that you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And jump down there to verse number 22. Because he mentions, you know, husbands and wives and all these other things. Verse number 22, specifically talking about workers, servants, people who have employers, people who have masters over them. Verse 22, servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. What does that mean? Well, if any of you have an employer, you could consider yourself a servant and the employer is your master. You have a boss at work. And what the Bible's saying here is that, you know, don't just obey. You know, he says obey in all things your master. So when the, when the boss tells you to do something, you do it. You work for him and you give him your best effort. He says, not with eye service as men pleasers. You know the people that are only going to pick up their wrench and start doing work. Oh, the boss is right here. Oh, I better, I better look like I'm busy, right? And kind of pretend and put on this show. Oh, I'm working real hard. And then the boss leaves and they're going back to sitting down, taking breaks, you know, whatever. The Bible says that's, you know, we ought not to be doing that. You shouldn't care. You, know, you shouldn't only be doing things because you just want to be a man pleaser. Just, oh, when the boss is looking, then I'm going to be busy and that's the only time. You ought to be able to not require supervision. To work as if you're working for Jesus Christ. That's why it says, you know, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he even spells it out here in Colossians 3. Look at verse 23. He says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. This is just mentioned just after he says, you know, obey your masters. Be a good servant. Be a good worker. And whatsoever you do, do it hardly. Put your heart into it. You know, hey, if you're going to do a job, make sure you get it done right. Put your, put, put your effort into it and say, and, and don't even, you know, if you have a problem with your boss or whatever, it's not, you know, it's not enough just to be working for a man. He's saying, do it as if your, your boss is Jesus Christ himself, as if you're working for God in whatever job you're doing. God wants us to be doing our best in every aspect and pushing ourselves uh, it says in verse 24, knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. So there's a little bit of a motivation even mentioned there as well. Look, God sees your work. You know, a lot of people have a bad attitude, a crummy attitude. I mentioned this already. You know, maybe you're not getting paid that well at your job. So you don't feel like I should be working that hard for them. And that's a bad attitude to have. Look, if you just work real hard, you can have faith knowing that God sees your work. If you're not being rewarded appropriately here, and look, I've never met one person that says, oh yeah, I get paid enough. I, I get paid the right amount. Everybody's underpaid, right? You talk to you like, oh man, I haven't had a raise this long and I do all this work and I should be making more money. Everybody has that attitude. Everybody does. It's like, yeah, of course. Oh, I, I don't feel appreciated. No one ever feels appreciated at work. It's just the way it is. But 
The Bible is saying, look, just work your best. Put your heart into it. Work as if you're working for Jesus Christ. Oh, are, are you going to have that type of attitude with Jesus Christ? Oh, gee, I can't. No way. I mean, we ought to have a proper fear of God to, to, to not be so stiff-necked and rebellious against Jesus that we would say, hey, anything, Lord, for you. I mean, you paid for my salvation. Whatever, whatever I could do for you, let me know and I'll do it. I'll do whatever grunt work you have for me, whatever it is. I'm not going to be lifted up in myself thinking I'm too good for any job that Jesus has for me. And that's the attitude that we need to have at work and in our lives and in everything that we do. Hey, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to put my whole heart into it and work as if Jesus Christ is my boss. And in a way he is because the Bible says, look, he's going to look down at your hard work and he's going to bless you for it. He blessed Joseph. And no matter what his situation was, and Joseph of all people could have had a rotten attitude. What did I do wrong? You know, my brother sold me into slavery. He could have thrown up his hands and given up and say, well, forget all this. But no, that's not the attitude he had. He stuck with it and he endured, whether he was in, in bondage or whether he was free. Everything that he did, he did with his whole heart and God blessed him for it. And God saw, you might have to work a long time. Jacob, Remember, Laban changed his wages. He's like, 10 times, you've been changing my wages. You haven't been paying me properly. But you know what? Jacob worked hard anyways. God saw it and God blessed him in the end. But so you have to have that faith that it's going to come. Jacob worked for, for decades for Laban. He worked a long time before he finally saw the end result of his hard labor. And God is making that same promise. He said, look, God's going to see what you're doing. You don't have to worry about it now. You don't have to take matters into your own hands. If something's not being done justly, God will make sure that everything is done right. You just work hard. You do the job you're supposed to do and let God deal with the rest. And that's the attitude that we have. And that's a testimony we ought to have as a Christian. If people know at work, and they ought to know, by the way, that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. It ought not to be something that you're hiding under a bushel. People ought to know your faith because you're trying to get them saved. People ought to know, hey, this is a Christian. And at the same time, when they see you as a Christian, you ought not to be the lazy worker, the one that just constantly needs supervision, the one that's constantly just only working when the boss is around. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We have a lot of people that, that want to do good by God and want to serve the Lord and want to have great opportunities. And I don't know individually, people are sitting here this, this evening, but especially if you are looking to do something big to serve God, if you really want to make a big impact with your life, if you want to be put in some position someday where you can just really have a massive influence over a lot of people. Joseph had a massive influence over a lot of people. But he worked hard and he paid his dues early on. So you can't expect just to have everything handed to you on a silver platter with you not putting forth your time and effort and energy and resources and working hard and staying up late and getting up early. You know, and a lot of people, especially these days, oh Lord help us with the amount of people who just want to be pastors of churches and just get, you know, send in for their online degrees and just start all these ministries and stuff without actually going through the work, being a good follower, being a good church member, putting forth, ministering, helping, proving themselves to be worthy according to, you know, what the Bible says, at least what the standards should be for a, for a bishop or an elder. And um, it's just everyone wants that shortcut. But that's not the way that God said it needs to be. We, we can't go for the shortcut. We need to, de to endure and go through the effort of, of learning and studying and doing all the hard work. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse number 10. This is a consistent teaching all throughout the Bible. Verse number 10 reads, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And what this is saying, we're going to continue reading here, but if you're dependable, if you're reliable on things that are just kind of a little, it's, just, it's not a big deal, right? In the little things. If you're not able to be faithful and to take care of the things that aren't really that big of a deal, it's like, well, so you have a job to do. And you're like, well, so what? That can wait. That's not that big of a deal just because you don't want to do it. Right? If you're not faithful to do those little things, I mean, maybe your job is to like clean the bathroom 
right? And say, well, you need to clean the bathroom once a week. And you're just like, yeah, well, it's not that bad. I don't think it's that big of a deal, so we can just put it off for another week. You just have that type of an attitude, right? You say, what's the big deal? It's not that big of a deal anyways. Well, if you can't be dependable to get your job done in those little things, the Bible says here, you know, uh, we'll keep reading, then who's going to give you a better job? Like, like you're never going to graduate from the job of washing bathrooms if you can't even do that right. If you can't even be reliable to do that job. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. Now, the bigger picture he's painting here is that it's the difference between, you know, serving money and serving God. That's what he's talking about. The unrighteous mammon is money versus serving the Lord. And he's saying, if you're not even faithful in little things, if you're not faithful in the small things, God's going to treat you the same way. If you're not faithful in the little things, if you're not able to just you know, read your Bible a little bit every day. If you're not able to do some of the small things, then how can you expect to do great things for the Lord? You need to show yourself faithful in the small things. And you say, if you're not even faithful in that, which is another man's, so you're a servant for somebody else and, you know, working on their field, working on their stuff, who's going to entrust to you? He says, who shall give you that which is your own? If you're looking for God to bless you, you say, why, why am I so poor? Why do I have all these problems? Look, work hard. Work for someone else, work your best, and God will bless you then and see, oh, okay, they're doing well with some, someone else's stuff, and now you can have your own. But see, covetous people don't want to hear this. That's why it says in there in verse 14, the Pharisees who were covetous, when they heard these things, they derided him. They derided Jesus Christ when he was teaching this concept. Why? Because they were covetous. Why? Because they were lazy. The Bible says that the Pharisees were, um, they were sayers of the word, but not doers. They were the ones that would say, yo, do this and do that. And the Bible says they wouldn't even lift up their finger. They would not do one little thing of the things that they were telling everybody else to do. They were covetous. They just wanted everything and didn't want to have to put in the hard work for it. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. I'm going to show you some more verses that we're all supposed to be working for our Father, our Heavenly Father, now that we're born again. Ephesians 2, I, I go to these verses all the time to try to show somebody how to be saved and how salvation is a free gift. It's not based on our works. You know, no matter how good you are, you can't earn it, you can't deserve it. It's given to you for free. Right, the, the famous verse is Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right, our salvation comes not of works, it's completely free, it's a gift from God. But then the next verse, verse number 10, is pertinent to people after you're saved, after you've received that free gift. Verse number 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So after you're saved, after you receive that free gift, after you're born again, you know what God has created you to do while you're born again? Unto good works. To be a good worker. Because think about it. What is, ultimately, what is this life all about? We are here in the grand scheme of things. In all of eternity... Our lives here are like a vapor. It's like a drop in the bucket. In the grand scheme of things, it's such a short period of time. Once you find Jesus, once you put your faith in Christ and you're saved, what is the point of your life? I mean, hey, eternity is secured. You have heaven to look forward to. Amen and amen. We have a desire to depart, as the Apostle Paul said, and to go be with the Lord. But to be here with you, he's saying, is needful. It's, it's, it's important for me. Why? Because he had a job to do because there's more people to reach. There's a lot of people who are lost out there to bring the gospel to. There's a lot of work to be done. In Christ Jesus, he, we're born again to do that work. 
We are to be ambassadors in his stead. Jesus Christ is not walking around on this earth anymore. He did for a very short period of time. He is no longer here. Our job now is to be an ambassador for Christ. We are representing Jesus Christ. We have a job that's given to us, and we need to be doing that job. We need to be making sure we are hard workers for, that cause, for the cause of Christ. Turn, if you would, to John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8, another example. I'm just going to show you how God expects us to be working for him. It's not just enough to be saved. It's not just enough to be saved and reading your Bible. It's not just enough to be saved reading your Bible and getting sin out of your life. Now look, those are all great things and God wants you to do all those things. But ultimately, that's really not work for God. That's just you trying to be right by God and not... And not transgressing the law. But God has a lot more for you to do than just to, I mean, because think about it. You could just lock yourself in your house and just do your best to try to make sure, well, I'm, I'm going to try my best just not to sin. God's still not going to be happy with that. If that's all you do, if that's, if that's your mindset of just, well, I'm just going to keep myself from sinning. I'm saved. There's so much more. I mean, that is not what your life is all about. Does God want you to get to sin out of your life? Amen. Absolutely. But the point is then to be more used of God, to be a better testimony, to show people that you actually have integrity and you believe the word of God, so you're getting sins out of your life, being more conformed to the image of his son while you're doing the work, while you're trying to, to shine that glorious light of the gospel that God has entrusted to you. John chapter 8, look at verse number 39. John 8, verse 39, the Bible says, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. This is when, when the, the Pharisees were arguing with Jesus. And they say, well, no, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. There's a concept being taught here in the Bible from Jesus Christ that being a child of someone reflects that, that person, the father, right? So in this case, he's saying, hey, if you really were Abraham's children, then you would be doing the works of Abraham. Abraham was a great man. He had a lot of faith. He believed in God and did the works of God. And if you're claiming to be a child of Abraham, then you should be like Abraham. That's what he's saying. And see, they're, they're so uh, focused on physically being descended from Abraham. But that's not what Jesus is talking about because he already said, look, I know that you're Abraham's seed. I know that. I know that physically, if you traced back your ancestry, you came from the loins of Abraham. But what he's saying is that you're not a child of Abraham because you're not doing the works of Abraham because you're not known the way that your father was known. You're completely against what Abraham did. He says in verse 40, but now ye seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. He said, Abraham didn't do that. Abraham wasn't looking to kill me. Verse 41, ye do the deeds of your father, then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your Father the devil. And the lusts of your Father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So even though they physically were descended from Abraham, he's saying, you're of your father the devil, because they were against Jesus Christ. They wanted to put Jesus to death. He's saying, you're known as a son by who your father is. Now, likewise, if you're born again today, your spirit is born again. God is your father. You are born of the seed. You are born of the word. He is your father. And if we are going to be known as children of God, we need to be doing the works of our father. And we have a perfect example in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is known as what? The son of God. He gave us the perfect example of how we need to be sons of God ourselves. how we need to be doing the hard work. And look at how hard Jesus Christ worked. Often we get, we get a, a very 
distorted picture or representation of Jesus Christ from the world, from modern art or from old artists or whatever that want to paint Jesus as just this total pacifist walking around and, and just like, you know, super mellow guy. Look, don't believe this artwork and depiction that the world gives of Jesus. If you want to know who Jesus was, let's read the Bible. Get it from Scripture. There's a lot of aspects of Jesus. I'm not saying he wasn't loving. He's very loving. But you don't have to be like this, like a, a, a hippie beatnik or whatever to be loving, right? That's not, that's not the image or picture of love. Jesus loved people so much that he told them the truth. And he told the truth so much that people wanted to kill him. He wasn't just tolerant of everything. If he was, then who would want to kill him? He preached about the sins of the world and the wickedness, and that's why people hated him. He exposed sin. He exposed the, you know, the, the, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and they wanted to kill him for it. It's very simple. He loved them, but he was a perfect example. Look at how much Jesus worked, too. When you read through the Bible, he's constantly out. He said, hey, I'm homeless. I don't have a home. When people said, we want to follow you wherever you go. We want to be your disciples. He says, you know, the, the birds of the air have nests, the foxes have holes, you know, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said, I don't, I don't even have a place to stay. Do you really want to follow me? And ask yourself that. Do you really want to follow Jesus? Because following Jesus and being a good son and just following the model he has is a lot of work. But that's what God expects of us. He wants his children to be hard workers. Jesus Christ, you look at how many, you know, he was going around sharing the gospel, preaching the word of God, and doing that by day. And what's he doing by night? Praying. We see him praying, going off in a mountain by himself, praying, praying halfway through the night, walking on water, coming back, catching up to his disciples on the boat, and all these things. He's just going from place to place to place to place to place, traveling around. Why? He didn't care about himself. He cared about others. And he had a job to do. He had work to be done, and he was doing it. Now, look, I, I know that we are not going to be as good workers as Jesus Christ was. We are not him, okay? But he is our model, he is the one that we look to. He is the one, well, if Jesus Christ went through this stuff, then we ought to at least be striving to do that too. Jesus Christ lost a lot of sleep while he worked on this earth. And he felt every minute of it. You say, oh yeah, but he was God in the flesh. Yeah, but he was in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He understands everything that we go through. He knows the physical weariness. He knows the emotional weariness. He knows what it's like to have your people from your own place, your own land, your own family turning against you. He knows all of that. The Bible says he was a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. He gets it, yet he still worked and pushed himself why? Because he didn't focus on himself. The focus was always on other people. Always. He came as a servant. And that is the example that we need to have and keep in our minds that we need to be good workers for Jesus Christ and, and not put him, and you know what? Not put his work last. So many people today just want to, well, when I have time, I'll do this and I'll do that. Well, oh, I didn't have time to read my Bible today. Oh, I didn't have time to pray today. Oh, I didn't have time. Why? Because you're doing everything else but anything to do for serving God. You've got your priorities screwed up if that's you. And look, that's been all of us at least at some point in our life. I'll admit to it. I'll own up to it. I've gotten too carried away with the cares of this world and working my job and doing all these other things. Now look, if you're a man working a job, feeding your family, you know, prior providing for your family is important and it's very scriptural and we ought to do that. But at some point you need to realize, hey, I'm, I need to be keeping God first no matter what. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the Bible says, and all these things shall be added unto you in, in reference, in context to people who are saying, you know, what shall we eat and what shall we wear? Food and clothing. Hey, food and clothing isn't a problem for almost everybody in the United States of America. You could work a minimum wage job anywhere and you could work for less than minimum wage and have food and clothing because that's really what you need in this world to get by. 
Unfortunately, we have too much of an attitude of, I need so much more. I need a car. I need an iPhone. I need this. I need that. I need to have air conditioning. I need to have all, you know, look, they're not needs. Those are wants, but we've grown so accustomed to this rich lifestyle that people are saying, well, I need this, I need this, so I need to work more. And I need to do, you know, and putting everything else in front of just serving God. The whole Bible, in, in, in the entire Bible, cover to cover, what is taught is that we need to be putting God first. The Ten Commandments, what are the first two commandments, right? I am God, you should have no other gods before me. He gets the preeminence. He gets the priority. When it comes to tithing, what is the tithe? It's a 10%, the first 10% of your increase. It's, 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 he gets the first, right? That's all about everything when it comes to your time, when it comes to everything, God gets the first. He deserves the first. We ought to be giving him the first, our best, not, not our leftovers, not our scraps, not, well, I'm too tired tonight because I worked, so I'm not even going to read. I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to go to bed and just start the new day. Hey, why not start the day off getting that stuff done? Then you don't have to worry about being tired later on. And just make sure you're getting what you need to get done for God. And look, come up with your own standards, okay? The Bible doesn't say you need to read this particular amount of Scripture every single day. It doesn't say that. But the Bible does liken God's Word to manna. And Jesus Christ said that we should live by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that we ought to treat his word as our daily nutrition. So you think about how often you eat a day. And that's a pretty good guideline of how often we need to be getting in God's word. Okay. But that's a whole other sermon <laughs> in and of itself. God wants us to be putting him first. God wants us to be hard workers for him. We need to be showing ourselves good children of our father. One other thing to keep in mind. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have the example of Jesus Christ and how hard he worked. But also bear in mind, keep in mind that there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ for believers. Where we're going to stand before God in everything that we did on this planet, on, on the short life that we have here. All of our works are going to come before God. And we are going to receive things of eternal value based on what we did for God that had eternal value. Now, this has nothing to do with our salvation. Salvation is a gift. You do not earn salvation. It's not a reward given to you because you're so good. That's already settled through the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. But what you do with your life after that, when you face God on, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be based on whatever you receive from him because he's, he's a rewarder of work. When you work for God, he wants to make sure you realize you didn't get saved from any of this stuff. If you're going to be a good child and work for him, hey, God will reward you for that. He'll pay you for the work that you do and praise God for that. That's all. He doesn't have to. He's not obligated to, but I think he just drives home the point that, look, salvation is free. It's completely free. So people who do no work for the Lord at all we're going to read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Hey, all their works are get burned up, but you know what? They're still saved. They're still saved. They're still going to heaven. Why? Because they received a free gift. They didn't work for it at all. But do you really want to be standing there at the end of your life after it's all done? It's all, you have no more opportunities to, to do that type of work and have nothing. We need to be, stay focused on the goal, on, on the end game, on, on what is the point of even being here? It's to work for God. It's not just to soak up the sun and, and just live a life of pleasure, just, just feeding your flesh. And really, I mean, pleasure, is, that's not even a, a, a really fair word to use in that example because feeding your flesh, it, it is one type of pleasure, it's, you know, a fleshly pleasure. But we shouldn't be worried about our flesh. I mean, flesh is sinful. You can get pleasure from serving God way more pleasure than gratifying your flesh, right? There are two different types of pleasure. One is just gratifying your flesh and you could feel pleasurable just wasting all of your time, right? 
just doing nothing, having a good time, having fun, right, by just going to amusement parks or however you want to spend your time, right, just going off, not necessarily doing anything sinful, but just kind of wasting your whole life. You can get that form of pleasure or you can serve God with your time and get a different form of pleasure. You know what? You're going to be tired. You know what? It's hard work. But you do get, look, when we went out soul winning day, was, did you have a good time going out there and knocking on doors and trying to give the gospel? Amen. I mean, it was great, you know, having that one opportunity. Look, we spent hours out there and only had one real opportunity for someone that actually gave us the time and listened to us. But thank God for that lady that listened because, I mean, we really got through to her. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and look, I'm not lifting up ourselves by any means. Don't get me wrong here. It was work. But it's, it's, it's way more, I'm, I'm so thankful I spent my time doing that today as opposed to just laying on the couch and taking a nap, which could have been pleasurable, but it's way more joyous to, to try to get through to somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ and change the destination of their soul from going to hell to going to heaven. It's way better. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's look at this in verse number 8. The Bible says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, that, excuse me, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Turn if you to Matthew chapter 25. Now, when he's talking about being accepted of God, there it says we labor that whether present or absent, meaning with the Lord or not with the Lord, he says we work that we may be accepted of him. That's not talking about being accepted like into heaven. It's just talking about being accepted like as a hardworking son, right? Someone who's doing good work for God. Hey, I want my dad to be proud of me. I want to be accepted in his eyes. Hey, you did a good job. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the acceptance he's talking about. And then he brings up, hey, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, where God's going to reckon with us. Hey, what did you do for me? You know, you got the free gift of salvation. What did you do with that? What did you end up doing for me? It's going to be embarrassing for the people who did nothing. But that's what short-sightedness will do to you when you just live for this earth, when you just live for, for physical pleasures instead of living for eternity, living for what's going to happen in the future. Matthew 25, verse number 14, we're going to have a parable here referring to the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 14, the Bible reads, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came, and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And notice the same concept. Oh, you've been faithful over a few things, a few little things. Well, hey, now I'm going to entrust to you the greater riches. Now be thou ruler over many things. It's, it's doing that work with the little bit that God has given us to then be blessed in the latter end with much more. Let's keep reading here the same, the same parable, verse number 22. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. 
His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant in an outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, when we look at this parable, we see what, you know, God has given these people talents. And in this case, it's talking about money, right? It's a talent of gold or whatever. It's, it's a sum of money. He's saying, I've given this person five, this person two, this person one. And he expects them to do something with it. Look, God has given you this, or in this, you know, the master in this case has given his servant something. Look, I need you to do something with this. I need you to be a man of activity. I need you to, to, to make this work. I'm entrusting you with these riches and I'm going away for a while and I'm coming back. So, you know, work with what I've given you. And it's the one that's slothful that doesn't do anything. Everybody else here, you know, hey, I worked with it. I got five talents, you know, five talents more. I, I doubled it. And that's what God is looking for us to do. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter number 12. Romans 12. It's the last place I'll have you turn tonight. Romans chapter 12. We're going to spend the rest of the sermon on this. We're almost done. Romans chapter 12. And we see, again, the concept of God wanting us to be busy, wanting us to work. Hey, I've given you these abilities. I've given you this talent. Go forth and use it. Use it to gain more people, gain more souls unto Christ. What are you doing with what God has given you? Now look, it's clear when we read the Bible, you read 1 Corinthians 14, we read other chapters, we're talking about gifts that God has given to us, and we're going to see that here in Romans chapter 12 as well. Not everyone has the same gifts or the same abilities. People have different jobs to do for the Lord. But what are you doing with, God has, with what God has given you? You know, the, the, in, in that previous parable, one servant was only given two talents and another was given five, right? It didn't matter whether they had two or five. What mattered and what he looked at was, what are you doing with those? So notice he had the same response, the person who gained five more that was given five, to the same person who had two and gained two. So even though the person who had two only gained two more, he says, well, you've been faithful over little. I'm going to make you ruler over much. So he, he, he had the same statement for both. And so what matters to God is it's not how much you started with or what you ended up bringing back because if you didn't have as many talents to start with, you don't bring as many back. It's what did you do with it? Are you serving God? Are you being profitable? Are you doing the work for God? And when God sees that, he'll bless you. Not everybody has the same opportunities in life. Some people are brought up in a, in, a, in a great Christian home, a great foundation where, you know, they get saved maybe at an early age. They've got everything going for them. You know what? God's going to expect more of that person because you've had everything. You've had every opportunity as opposed to someone who didn't have the best upbringing or whatever, but then maybe they get saved later in life. Okay, things are a little bit harder, but you know what? They still have to deal with what they have. You still have to work with whatever it is that you've been given. Wherever you're at in your life, you know, don't, don't uh, say, oh, I can't do anything for God because I've done all these other things. Look, no, you can still, if you're still here today, God's got a job for you to do. Because God's not going to take you home until you're done here. And it's going to be different for everybody, but... We need to remember that as long as you're breathing here, God's got something for you to do. Amen. Romans chapter 12, look at verse number one. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It says here to offer up yourselves a living sacrifice. Those are some strong words. Don't just skip over that. When he's saying, offer up yourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, this is what is, this is, what is expected of us as God's children. It's not this, this 
fluff, hypocritical Christianity that God wants from us. He wants us working for him. He wants us to offer up ourselves a living sacrifice. And he said, you know what he saw that? It's not like, man, if you do that, you are just the best Christian in the world. If you offer up yourself a living sacrifice, he says, you know what? That's a reasonable service. He says, that's reasonable. That's that, I mean, that's totally reasonable that we would offer up our whole self as a living sacrifice to God. Sure, that's reasonable. That's not even going above and beyond. Why? Because God bought your soul. He paid for all of your sins. He's given you the gift of eternal life. Of course it's reasonable to think that, that the God that loves you and has completely forgiven everything wrong you've ever done and saved you from an eternity of hell, you can give your life for that. You can offer up, hey, well, it's pretty humbling to receive such a gift to just say, well, God, what can I do for you? Unfortunately, just like when Jesus healed the ten lepers, there was only one that returned to even to thank him. And that's the way things are today. There's a lot of people that, that end up getting saved, that they put their faith in Jesus Christ, and very few that will turn back and say, you know what, God, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? I'm going to offer up myself a living sacrifice and just do whatever it is you want me to do. Very few. It's a shame. It really is a shame. And just because the other nine didn't turn back to give thanks doesn't mean they weren't healed. And we're not, we're not the type of church that, that just says, well, if you're not doing all this stuff and if you have still sin in your life, then you're not really saved. No. So even the free gift, it's really easy to receive eternal life. You could still, look, you can still be saved and sin afterwards because I don't know someone who doesn't sin. <laughs> look, if you can't sin after you get saved, then I'm not saved. But if you, if you can't sin after you get saved, then you don't really have eternal life. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So anyhow, I don't want to get off on that rabbit trail. Let's, let's finish up the sermon here. Look, God wants us to, to be a living sacrifice. What does that mean? You sacrifice your time. You work hard. And I want everyone to know here, you know, this isn't my church. This is our church. I mean, a church is a congregation. I mean, if it's anyone's church, it's Jesus' church. He's the head of this church. But I want you to know, I mean, you are a, every single person here, every member of our church is, is an important person and important to this church. And God has given us different abilities. There's different people here who have different skills. And God has gifted you in different areas. But God wants you using what it is that he's given you to work for him. Church, you know, people have too much. And look, I had this mindset myself for the longest time. So uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not just trying to attack you if you have this mindset of coming into a church with an attitude of just, well, what is the church going to do for me? What, what, you know, I want you to, to, to teach what I want you to teach. I want, you know, and having this attitude of coming in and just wanting everything from church. That's the raw, that's a backwards attitude. God wants us to come in to a church, to a group. How can I be a blessing? How can I be a servant? What can I do? How can I better things? How can we get the, the gospel out there? What more can I do? That's the true attitude. Now, look, I, I get it. It's easy to come into church and to sit down and, um, and to criticize the pastor. I, well, he said that, or, you know, I, I can't believe he said that. What, you know, and just be real critical of everything that goes on here and then go home and do nothing. Well, you know what? I'm not claiming to be perfect. And I'll probably say things that you don't agree with or say things that might even make you angry. Okay? But if you're just going to go home and do nothing, then I don't want to hear about it. If you're working, if you're doing something for Christ, come to me and, and try to help explain to me where I'm wrong, where I'm in error. Look, I'll be open to that. But if you're not doing anything and you're just going to be critical of, of, of what we do, or oh, I can't, you shouldn't do this, you should be like, come out and do some work yourself and show me how you do the work and I'll be willing to listen. Because yep. people get way too hypercritical over all these little details that don't do anything themselves. Let's keep reading here. Verse number, uh, verse number three, Romans 12. Almost done. 
For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God has given every man a different measure of faith. Now, what we need to have is whatever faith you have, it all needs to be in Christ, obviously, but we all have different levels. God has given, has dealt, has given out a measure of faith. Now, verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. What's this saying? A member is just like a body part. We have one body. We have a lot of different body parts. Right? We have fingers, eyes, ears, nose. He's saying they don't all have the same office, meaning the same function. Right? They don't have the same job. Your nose is for smelling, your eyes for seeing, your ears for hearing, right? all these different things. And he's saying it's the same thing in the body of Christ, which is the church. We're all different members. We're all different individuals. And we're all here to have a different function but we're all working together. Everything in your body, all of your senses, you know, it all works together for the one common goal of whatever you are doing, whatever you decide to do in the command center, in your brain, right? You control your arms, your legs, your feet. Well, Christ is the head of the church. So he's the one determining what he wants the church to do. And we are all members that are compiling this body to get the work of Christ done. And that's why it's so important also to have unity within the church because we don't want to have a left hand over here and a right hand over here and they're fighting each other. You're never going to get anything done that way. We need to be working together. Hey, we're going to work in this first. We're going to pick up this book. We need both hands to be on the same page and not trying to do two different things. We need to have that type of a unity. Amen. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given, unto, given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. That means hate. Hate that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Now, before I go even further, in verses 5 through 8 there, he's talking about different gifts, being members one of another. And he talks about ministering which is serving other people, helping other people, is, could be one of the gifts, teaching, being able to instruct people, exhorting, encouraging people. Look, people are good at these different things. Some people, you know what? They're just not that very good at encouraging others, right? They may have a real dry personality or real quiet or something like that. They're just not very good at offering encouragement. But some people are excellent at that. Some people are really good at saying, being able to say the right things and kind of in tune and being able to notice when someone needs a little bit of encouraging words, they're great. Hey, if you have that ability, use that. That's what he's saying. If you're really good at breaking things down and teaching, hey, you, you could be used of God to be a good teacher. If you can, you know, even, even giving, you know, some people have been blessed with a lot of money. Say, you know what? Give, do it with simplicity. Don't make a big deal out of it. Ruling with diligence and showing mercy with cheerfulness. Right, overlooking, you know, and some of these things, you know, I don't believe are necessarily specific to any one person. These are all things we should be striving to be good at in general. But God's saying, you know, there's all these different things, and this is the attitudes that we ought to have, and this is the way that we ought to, to use what God has given us within the church. So let's keep reading here in verse number, let's start back at verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business. In this whole sermon, I've been trying to talk about being a hard worker, being a man of activity, not slothful in business, not being lazy in the work that you do. Be a hard worker, fervent in spirit. It means you're fired up, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints Given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Now look at this short list here. And even just, you know, with, there's so many things not even in here, but just, just say, if you're going to analyze yourself at how much you're working for God, are you slothful in your business? Are you kind of lazy? 
Are you fervent in your spirit? Are you fired up serving God? Are you rejoicing in hope? Hope of Jesus Christ, the hope of, of eternal life, the hope of everything that we have from the Bible. Are you patient in tribulation when hard times come? Are you getting through that? Are you patient through that? Look, these are all godly things. Continuing instant in prayer. Having a good prayer life. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Looking out for other believers and helping them in their times of need. Giving to hospitality. And you know, blessing those that persecute you. Having the proper attitude of of not being lifted up in pride when someone attacks you. Being able to bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. We need workers, and we need workers here. We need workers in this church. We need people who, and I mean, obviously all around the world, God wants his children to be hard workers. Are you zealous? Do you really want, you know, do you want to offer up yourself a living sacrifice? Now, there's a lot of things that I have in mind that I want to do in this church, but we need more people to help work. Now, look, I know we're a real small church, and I'm not downing anybody here by any means. Okay, so don't take this the wrong way. Because the people that have been here have been a great blessing and there's been a lot of people doing a lot of work for this church. So, so believe me, don't try to do this the wrong way. But, but just keep in mind that there's always more work to be done. There's always more things that we want to be pushing forward to be working as hard as we can to get things done. So I've got some things just, just listed here of things that we need to be doing. Number one, we need to be thinking about other things we could be doing to reach more people with the gospel. That is the primary function and focus of this church. That's why we offer the different soul winning times because the whole point and goal of even being saved is to go out and preach the gospel to the lost. That is what this church is all about. That is the primary function. But there are also a lot of other things we do. So one of the ways that we get the gospel out to other people is we also put up videos on YouTube. We put up videos on the internet because we want to reach more people. We have more of an impact and try to get out to as many people as possible. So I need to be able to make videos. We're, we do some extra marketing and try to get into different ads and stuff to get the word out because we're trying to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. We make newsletters to keep in touch with people that visited. You know, we need to be doing more ministries. The Bible says in James chapter 1 that pure religion undefiled is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. We need to be reaching more you know, nursing home ministries, drug rehab places, prisons, and places like this to reach more people. But in order to do this, you know, while we're still this small, you know, the pastor's only one person, you know, and I'm working a full-time job in addition to, to pastoring a church. And, I, and I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm looking for workers. Let's get, yo, this is our church. Let's do more. Let's reach more. Let's do whatever you can do. You know, decide for yourself how much time you're willing to devote to God. Are you willing to, to offer yourself a, a, you know, a living sacrifice? And look, none of this is for my benefit. It's all for the benefit of Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the whole point here. We need all the little things being done, the church building being kept in order. We need to be following up with new converts, people we wouldn't have Christ. We need to be doing, there's, there's so many things that goes on and on. Okay, and I'm not even going to go through everything on here. We need more workers. If we're going to get a big job done here and reach the most amount of people, we need people stepping up to do the work. It's the bottom line. And if you have any desire, because, you know, we have some, some guys here, if you have any desire to, to pastor or have more responsibilities, we need to start off showing that you're ready for the job that you want to do by showing yourself faithful in that which is least. Showing up to the church services. Get here early. Don't be coming in, you know, five, ten minutes late every time. Show that you're faithful, that you're dependable, you're reliable. Get involved. And if you say that you're going to help with something, then do it. Be reliable. Be dependable. Don't be someone that requires supervision. I don't have the time to be looking over everybody's work that, you know, oh, I want to help out with the church, I want to do this. I don't have the time to be watching over everybody's stuff. Maybe when I go full-time, I have a little bit more time to be able to, to do that. But right now, I need people that can work that don't need to be watched over every second and every little thing that you do. I, you know, and it's not for me. Again, it's for, it's for the cause of Christ. So, um, 
I'll close with this one verse, Philippians 4.13, very, very popular verse. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And we need to keep that in mind. When, we, when you look at the job ahead, don't be daunted by it. Don't let that you know, scare you about how much work we need to do. Just remember, we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. It, you know, anything that we do, Jesus Christ is the one that empowers us through the Holy Ghost to work for him. Whatever job that God has for you to do, he's going to give you the ability to do it. And we ought not to be limiting God by saying, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. You just need to have faith and say, you know what? If God's empowering me, I can do anything. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And it's not just the Apostle Paul that can do all things. Oh, well, he's special. He's an apostle. No. This is, this is written for our admonition. It's because he has Christ. The only reason why the Apostle Paul was able to do all the things that he did is because he had Jesus Christ to empower him. That's why. And he was willing to offer up himself a living sacrifice. See, that's where we cut God short. God can do everything. God gave the power to all these. We, we, oh man, I love reading these stories. We're reading about going through the kings, the books of the kings, and Elijah and Elisha, and we read these stories of these great men of God that have, you know, these miracles being performed, and they're super cool, it's super exciting. And at the end of the day, I think oftentimes we sell God short because you still are kind of relying on your own strength and your own power to get things done. You need to get over that. I mean, and this is the number one reason why people don't go out and go soul winning and try to preach the gospel to other people is because they think, I'm not a very good speaker. I'm not very good at this. I don't think I know the Bible well enough. You know, what happens if this happens or they get intimidated, they get scared? You know, look, God, will you, and, and this isn't some special gift only given to certain people. This is something that has been commanded and instructed for all believers to do is to preach the gospel to every creature. That is all of our jobs. And if anybody can change, if, if I was able to change, then anybody can. Nobody here besides my wife knows, knows who I was, I call it my previous life, okay? Before I got saved, before I got you know, into, into a good church and, and kind of got right with God. People here don't know the old Dave Burzens. But I'll tell you what, I, I still, I work as a computer programmer. And if you know anything about people who are into computers and, and kind of techie and math and science side people, they're not the most outgoing individuals. Okay? That's me. Yet I'm still standing up today in front of a group of people and preaching God's word. And it's not because I have some great abilities at all. It, believe me, it is not under my own power that, that has gotten me to this position whatsoever. I was a tight in high school. I mean, I dreaded speech class. I hated it. I, read, I had to read it. Even though I got marked down for it, I had to read everything. I could not speak in front of people. Getting up made me physically ill to my stomach to have anybody kind of looking at me while I'm talking. Okay. But when I got into a good church, a church that cared about other people, a church that was a soul winning church, I knew from God's word, hey, it is my job to go soul winning. And I'm not right with God if I'm not preaching the gospel to people. This is something that is so important. It didn't take very long to convince me that I needed to be doing this. Yet I still had the fear and the dread of approaching a random person and talking to them about Jesus. It's intimidating and I understand it, but look, if you are willing and you're able to just say, well, God, if this is what you want me to do, then I'm just going to do it because I'm going to trust that you'll be able to use me. The Bible says with, with uh, stammering lips and a stuttering tongue, you know, he, he's, he could use you to, to, to preach the gospel and to preach the word, that it's not your own power, that he will give you what you need to get the job done. And was, it, was I fearful at first? You betcha. I didn't want anyone to answer the doors when we went out and, and, and you know, started talking to people. But you know what? God can change that. and can change you and give you the right heart and the right attitude to where when you go out soul winning, you ought to be thinking about, hey, the, you know, have compassion and love for someone and say, I'm willing to get over myself and get over my fears 
If it's going to mean somebody else can die and go to heaven because they've received Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. We need to, to get over ourselves in many areas and, and be someone who God can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that we receive from your word, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to be fired up in our spirit, to do more to serve you, dear Lord. Um, I thank you for, for working in my life and, and doing wonders to, to help me um, where I def, def, desperately and definitely needed it, dear Lord. And I know I'm not perfect now. I pray that you please just help me as well as everybody else here to have more boldness, to, to, to make the time for you, to make you a priority, and to make sure that we are, we are living a life that is going to be pleasing in your sight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.